Living in Southern California, we are surrounded by super successful people living in multi-million dollar homes and mansions. Most of this wealth was accumulated through hard work, great business ideas, innovation, and maybe a little bit of luck. But there's a fair share of it that came from something that we call ill-gotten gains, basically deceit, fraud, embezzlement, shady business practices, or whatever else. All my life, I've had a peculiar fascination of new stories that cover the fall from grace and the reckoning that follows. One story in recent years hit home hard with me. It's a story that I kind of lived through, but I was kind of removed from it, and I was lucky to not be involved as an innocent casualty. The story revolves around a certain Lamborghini dealer here in Orange County, California. The name, Platinum Motors. There's a lot of places called Platinum Motors. I'm talking about the one that existed 15 years ago. It's a story, though, that seems to suggest that crime does pay if you have the right legal team. <laughs> And I think that's not news to anybody, especially in this country. We're gonna find out who did what to who for how many cookies right after the break. Did you know that the average driver gets nine traffic tickets in their lifetime? Look, I'll be the first to admit that I've taken maybe a couple of liberties with traffic laws back in the day. And of course, when I got caught, I had to go to court to fight the ticket, which was always a hassle. And each time that I lost my case, it meant big fines, points on my record, and higher insurance premiums. Eventually, I realized that nothing beats having a good attorney argue your case in court. So here's what you do. You download the Off The Record app to your phone and register for an account. And if you get a ticket, simply upload a photo of your ticket into the app and you will be quickly matched with a lawyer in your jurisdiction. Your lawyer will start working your case right away and in most cases, you'll never have to set foot in a courtroom. Off the Record has a 97% success rate and a 4.9 star rating on Google. And guess what? They even offer a money back guarantee if they aren't able to reduce the points or keep that ticket fully off your record. Best of all, I've arranged a 10% discount for all of my YouTube viewers. So download the app and register using the referral code FASTLIFE to receive 10% off your first case. As a young boy in the 1970s, I grew up with posters of exotic cars on my wall, just like many teens did around the world. Among those was a poster of a Lamborghini Countach. On my 13th birthday, I made a promise to myself. I said that by my 40th birthday, I would have a Lamborghini. And on November 21st, 2002, I kept my promise to myself. I bought this car a beautiful 1998 Diablo Monterey edition, one of eight such cars. I purchased the car from Fox Valley Motor Cars in Chicago. Shout out to Fox Valley for not telling me that the rear tires were already expired and had to be re replaced before I could drive the car. Anyway, you know how they say never meet your hero? <laughs> I have another saying that I started repeating after I bought that car. There's a 50-50 chance that your dream car will become a nightmare and that car was a nightmare, it was an absolute nightmare. Had to fix a bunch of stuff in the first several months all, of, all because of deferred maintenance and I sold the car after a year or so and I replaced it with a 2001 Diablo, a newer car in better condition and sold to me by Lamborghini, a dealer with a better reputation. Take that Bill Nuccio if you're watching you. Come back anyway. Anyways, after the tie ordeal with the blue car, I wondered what else Fox Valley Motors failed to disclose. So I decided it was probably a good time to take my car to the local Lamborghini dealer here in Orange County, California. My local dealership, as you guessed, it was a place called Platinum Motors. Now there's lots of places called Platinum Motors. Make sure you're talking about this one, the one in Orange County. It was run by a guy by the name of Vic Koulian. Now I don't judge people by how they look, but during my only interaction with the guy, he came off as a typical car salesman, just didn't give me a good vibe. I asked him about a Giardo that he had on the sales floor, and he just kind of brushed me off, not knowing that I was literally picking up my Diablo from the service department that same day. And I think that's kind of a, a cardinal sin with exotic cars. Don't judge a person by their appearance and vice versa. But the vibe he gave, I knew instantly I would never buy anything from that guy, and I went on my merry way, and I didn't give it a second thought until on one of the forums I saw that the, his Lamborghini dealership was shut down seemingly without warning and a lot of people were wondering what the hell happened. There were stories about it all over the internet on different forums, but it was, the story was going on for years. So just recently I dug up the history and it's a story that really has to be told because the outcome only happened determined a few years ago. So let me tell you the story. Vic started off as a small time broker of exotic cars in Newport Beach, California. His specialty seemed to be Lamborghinis. In 1995, the existing Orange County Lamborghini dealership was basically handed over to him because nobody else seemed to want it. In the early 1990s, Lamborghinis were not good cars. 
But in order to survive, he had to hunt for cars. And in early 1998, he bought out the entire inventory of Automobili Lamborghini USA, which at the time was owned by Chrysler. He got a great deal paying only the importer cost, which was around $35,000 below dealer cost. Now that's a good profit margin. There were a total of 20 cars and that basically got him up and running. By 1998, Vic had doubled Lamborghini USA sales from a measly 48 cars during the year to about 100 cars, which was, as it turns out, half of the total Lamborghini production worldwide. <laughs> Here's 50% of it. On the surface, he seemed to be killing it. But behind the scenes, there was already a few little hints that something was not right. <laughs> For starters, as the world didn't find out until much later, was the fact that Vic's sisters, Nora, Sassy, and Estrici, were listed as owners of Vic's business enterprises. What? <laughs> Why? I'm sure your imagination could conjure up any number of reasons as to why that was the case and it wasn't in his name but it would be hard to think of one that seemed to suggest any noble cause. Kind of a red flag, as we say in America. In summer of 1998, Audi AG became the sole owner of Automobili Lamborghini, their first order of business to oust Vic Coolian as the official importer. They didn't want him controlling all the supply of Lamborghinis in the United States. Good move, as it turns out. <laughs> But this was going to be a lengthy legal process that ended up taking two years. And by the 2000, Audi finally wrestled the control back from the Koolians. And so he was out as the official importer. But when the dust settled about 2002, the Koolians still had their dealership, but they were officially no longer the importers. Not long after, in 2004, the Giardo was released and it was an immediate hit. And within a year, Platinum Motors was killing it. They were selling about 200 cars a year. They were now the largest Lamborghini dealer in the entire world. It's a big thing. Celebrities gobbled these cars up like free caviar. Nicolas Cage, Kobe Bryant, Sharon Stone, and Dennis Rodman were amongst the celebrity clientele. It was all over the news. He was always, uh, they were always talking about Platinum Motors and it was doing great. All outward appearances seem to suggest that this man was building a legitimate empire and realizing the American dream. Everybody's rooting for the guy, right? But even with these achievements, Vic was already getting a bit of a reputation for how he conducted his business affairs. By most accounts, Vic seemed to have a way of making simple deals complicated or simply screwing up the deals altogether, or worse yet, just not keeping promises or honoring his commitments. And it was something that was repeated by a great deal of people and it was all over the form. So it wasn't just rumor. Before long, there was a long line of angry customers, disenfranchised clients, and fellow car dealers that didn't want to do business with him. And if you think some car dealers screw over customers, you should see how some car dealers treat other car dealers. <laughs> Let's just say there's often a lot of animosity between car dealers. Still, he had a good thing going. The business seemed to be thriving. And with a gross margin of about $25,000 per car, he was raking in a pre-tax income of about $5 million per year after expenses. That comes out to about $2 million a year in profits. Pretty good salary for one guy, right? And that's profits after paying his people. I came a, an article written by someone close to the rise and fall of Platinum Motors that was written several years ago right after the whole thing kind of exploded. It goes like this. In what can only be called egotistical madness, Vic embarked on several other ventures starting around 2005, which would prove to be the beginning of his end. Okay, so we got to set the stage. So what happened? I'll tell you what happened. In 2005, this was during the height of the real estate bubble here in the United States. Vic bought three empty lots in the Santa Ana Auto Mall for about $6 million and a freeway frontage showroom for $9 million. Now at the time, this seemed like a smart investment in his own future. And it would have been if he had stopped right there, but he didn't. Despite the fact that he was now saddled with $15 million in debt, he went on to another round of acquisitions. First, he attempted to develop a 60-acre winery in Temecula, California, along with a 120-room resort. Then, he got himself knee-deep into a proposal to develop a 154-room resort in Escondido, California. Both of these ventures quickly fell apart. How much he invested in each one to get him started, who knows. But he wasn't done yet. He then bought the lots of two failed restaurants in South Orange County, where he intended to build two new car dealerships. And again, the timing was okay. It seemed like it was a good idea. And lastly, he bought land on Pacific Coast Highway, which is very expensive, 
for another new car dealership and then opened two satellite showrooms one up near Calabasas, California, and one in Newport Beach. All of these properties were very expensive even back then. The dude was spending money like a drunken sailor. In another time, in a surging economy, he might have built an empire, but it was not to be. We all know what came next. By the time all this shook out, it was now 2008, and the credit crunch had triggered a housing crash, and the economy tanked globally. People were losing their homes to foreclosures, and all those cars bought with home equity loans were now in peril. The recession affected many industries, especially exotic car sales. No one was buying anything and Vic found himself irretrievably overextended. Worse yet, the rumor was that Vic allegedly owed a lot of money to the kind of people you don't want to owe money to. <laughs> Organized crime, for those of you who, didn't, who missed the inference. With his cash flow now gone, he did the unthinkable. He held a fire sale. He dumped 54 cars at below wholesale prices. Now, I know you're trying to figure out, well, how cheap that was. I'm going to tell you how cheap these cars were. <laughs> Court records show a fellow by the name of Luvon Gugasian paid $60,000 for a 2009 Lamborghini LP640. VW Credit had it originally financed at $387,000. Gugasian, who owned Newport Collectibles, another exotic car dealer, actually purchased 23 cars from Vic during this fire sale. Sure. <laughs> Who wouldn't buy these cars at 60,000 bucks? <laughs> Makes total sense. <laughs> Doesn't seem suspicious at all, does it? Google search on Gugasian shows that he was connected also to Newport Exotic Cars, a company that he ended up suing in the court. In fact, Gugasian had legal problems going back all the way to 1982 when he and his attorney were caught up in a wire fraud and bribery case, a case in which his attorney was disbarred for his actions. <laughs> so. I'm just saying that maybe he wasn't keeping good company. <laughs> All told, Vic netted $8.1 million from the sales of those cars at the fire sale, but he still owed $12 million to VW Credit. So he got $8 million, he didn't pay them. However, not a dime of that $8.1 million made its way into VW Credit's pockets. Where did the money go? It's anyone's guess. <laughs> Some speculated that Vic chose to pay off those other debts alleged to be owed to people who don't give extensions if you catch my drift rather than giving it to vw credit either way vw credit didn't get paid out of course the feds were soon involved and they impounded 13 of those lamborghinis that were sold during the fire sale leaving the people who purchased those cars out the money vw credit promptly canceled all the warranties on the other cars that were not impounded and they also flagged them so they could not be sold. What happened to those cars is a mystery to me, but I'm sure somebody knows. Word was that Vic had a relative at the DMV who was removing liens from titles to get those cars registered. So maybe some people were able to sell them and get them registered by getting the liens removed. Don't know for sure, but it has been suggested. On May 11th, 2009, Colleen pled guilty to one count of wire fraud in a prearranged deal with the district attorney, reportedly to keep his sisters out of jail. At that point, he was then facing 30 years in jail and a million dollar fine. But when the actual sentence did finally come down in 2010, it was reduced to 12 years in prison. By that time, he was also facing several civil lawsuits filed by Volkswagen Credit, as well as many other creditors. So the guy was blowing a lot of money on attorney's fees. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, Koolian's lawyer discovered records that basically established that Volkswagen Credit was indeed, quote, well aware that the cars referred to in the plea agreement were sold and that Volkswagen Credit never had any right to the proceeds from the sale of any particular vehicle. Now, I don't know what that agreement looked like, but it would be interesting to see. Moreover, Cooligan's attorney learned that Volkswagen Credit knew all along that the money was not being immediately paid back to VW Credit when the cars were being sold. This arrangement with VW Credit was part of a joint effort by VW Credit and the Lamborghini factory and Cooligan to support the reputation of the Lamborghini brand and Lamborghini expansion plans. So what was going on with Lamborghini uh, is, is, a, is a secret. I've heard things, but I'm not gonna repeat. In April 2012, Cooligan filed a motion seeking to withdraw his guilty plea, citing this newly discovered evidence and claiming that Cooligan always believed that the fraud allegation was false, but could not prove it until he obtained the documents as part of the civil suit with VW Credit. And once he got that, they went back to the court and Koolian's motion also alleged that he was told that if he did not plead guilty, he would be charged with money laundering, 
and would face a significantly larger sentence. This is a tactic of law enforcement. If you don't plead guilty to this, we're going to throw more charges on it. And also that if he did not plead guilty, his sister would be charged with fraud as well. Again, tacking on charges to scare you into a guilty plea. They're just trying to get a conviction. Using legal tactics to delay sentencing no less than 10 times, Vic never saw the inside of a jail cell. Then on July 2nd, 2012, the U.S. District Judge, a fellow by the name of Cormac Carney, granted Coolian's motion. His guilty plea was withdrawn and the conviction was vacated in 2014. What does that mean in plain speak? Essentially, he beat the rap. He, he walked. And the story seemed to end there, but I wanted more. I wanted to see if there was more development since then because that conviction was vacated now seven years ago. So doing some detailed web searches, I found an address for Vic Coolian in Whitefish, Montana, and at least one of his sisters up there doing real estate, which is, I believe she came from a real estate background to start with. If you look at this picture, it says 3065 River Lakes Drive, Whitefish, Montana, which is a home that was allegedly in his name, according to the records. Uh, you can take a look at it going on to a site like uh, Zillow or Redfin. But what's really interesting, during this period, that period from 2006 to 2010, there was a lot of stuff going on. Along Pacific Coast Highway in Newport Beach, exotic car dealerships during that period came and went. And the, all these buildings, it was one name one day and one name another day. Some of them were going out of business, other dealers were moving. It, it, it just did, I didn't understand what's going on, but all of it makes sense now in that context. And again, while not all exotic car dealerships are bad, it would be very wise of you to, to do your research before you buy an exotic car. But I would strongly recommend that you do not do business with the coolies. And if you do, best of luck to you. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the story. There's more to come.